So, to continue from this morning, um, I think the word Buddhism have a different connotation by now and sometimes it's understandable that people don't want to consider themselves Buddhist. But when I'm talking about follower of Buddha, when, when I'm talking, you know, when I say I'm a Buddhist, I'm talking about being a follower of the Buddha or the follower of the teaching of the Buddha. Path exists when there is a habit, habitual patterns. Then path exists. If there is no habit, there is no reason for there is no reason or purpose for path. Habit is a problem because what habit does is hab habit um, take uh, habit take control. You become enslaved by habit. Habit distorts your views. Habit dis uh, distorts everything. You are view and therefore your meditation therefore action and then leads you to disappointment pain anxiety etc Ironically, the path itself is also a habit. So what I'm saying is Buddhism, so-called Buddha Dharma, the path of the Buddha, is also a habit. But if you look carefully into Buddhist path, especially if you go deeper into the Buddhist path, all, even though the paths are habitual, just another de carefully designed, deliberately designed, consciously designed habit, a new habit. As you go deeper, these habits are designed to destroy habit itself. You understand? It's, it's, a, it's like, a, um, let's say, there's the solution, I mean, there's the problem and there's the solution. So, so when we talk about habitual pattern, we are talking about the, the solution, which is also, which is of course habit, as I've been saying. But the solution is also just another carefully designed and prepared habitual pattern. But the thing is, Many of the Buddha's teaching, and especially as, as you go deeper, these habitual patterns that are known as the antidote, they're designed to cancel itself, erode itself. They're designed to work with the problem, of course, because that's why it is the solution, but it is also designed to exhaust itself. And the reason why this is so is because of the fundamental view. So <clears throat> this is why I was talking about, like, this is why for me, um,
someone who time to time remind ourselves that I have surrendered myself to the truth of impermanence, the truth of everything not truly existent, so on and so forth. It is far more non-deceiving than seemingly very wholesome, seemingly very serene and uh, purit uh, moralistic, puritanical practices such as non-violence, such as samadhi, meditation, so on and so forth. And I, I need to emphasize this. What I'm trying to say is this. I would be happy when, you know, when the Buddhists talk about, you know, they have been Buddhists for like years, two years, three years, and then what do you do as a Buddhist? They say, oh, I meditate every day. I s and what, what does that mean? I sit and watch my breathing. I do mindfulness. That's very good. I'm not discouraging this. This is, of course, fantastic. It has a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, um, goodness. There's a lot of wholesomeness in it. But I would prefer if someone said, well, I've been Buddhist for two years. And then the other person, what do you do as a Buddhist? Well, you know, I keep, Sometimes I remind myself that everything that is compounded is impermanent. None, none of this is going to last. I, I sort of contemplate on this. This would be better for me. You understand? I like to hear this more. Or something like, you know, as a Buddhist, time to time when I'm riding my bus or a taxi or when I'm driving home, I think that what I see the appearance is not really what it is. It appears to be beautiful, it appears to be solid, it appears to be this and that, right, left, good, bad, virtue, non-virtue, but it's all my projection. And I try to think of this at times as a Buddhist. I would be happy to hear this from those who claim. Um, <clears throat> rather than boasting how many prostrations they have done or how many hours they have sat, how many, I don't know, um, vows they have taken, how many sadhanas they do. That would be better. Um, see, again, going back to the habit, you, you know, I said, path is a habit. Path is supposedly a good habit trying to defeat the bad habit. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an art of adopting the right habit to defeat the wrong, uh, wrong habit. So this is why when I, say early, uh, when I say this morning, even if you can think of the truth such as um, knowing the suffering, cause of the suffering, that suffering that one can uh, seize the suffering and that there is actually a path to the cessation of the suffering. Even if you can think about that, one minute every month. Because you know the habit, for habit, one of the things about the habit is you need consistency. Of course, every hour would be the best, every minute would be the best, but we are talking about a bunch of lazy people here. So this is why, aren't we supposed to, you know, if you are not lazy, you are not welcome here, by the way. <laughs> I'm hoping that you are all lazy. I'm hoping that you are all these people who means kind of well, who kind of likes Buddhism, who has been liking and admiring Buddhism for 20 years, but never really 
sat down and practiced, never really, you know, like, but keep on, like, you know, having that kind of admiration. That is a habit. And I, I'm, what I'm saying is it is a far more important and precious habit than habit of sitting. Yes, habit of sitting without the understanding of the shunyata or without the, without the admiration. I forget understanding. I'm not even going that far. I'm going really on the basic level. Understanding the shunyata, understanding the impermanence, understanding the four noble truth. I'm talking about just admiring, just liking that teaching. Just thinking that this convinces me. This is really good. Just developing that habit once a month for one minute. I'm saying that it's more important than sitting doing mindfulness. Why? Why? Because mindfulness, if you are, if your purpose of being mindful is just to tame your mind, you understand, just to tame your mind, control your mind, knowing your mind, without all this, without the admiration to the right path, it has a good, good side effect, such as you will become less stressed, probably you'll be more fresh, you'll be more, uh, I don't know, you'll be more skilled, you'll be more creative, probably you better, you'll have a better sleep, but you are, not, you are not a Buddhist. You are just a person who l loves to be not stressed, which you know, we are all. And for that, there are a lot of things you can do. You can have a good massage. You can just have a good walk in the forest. All of this you can apply. But I'm talking about being a Buddhist here. Being, or the follower of the Buddha. Okay. Now, of course, as a human being, we want to be, we always think that we, you know, we are ambitious also, we are, you know, we have ego. We have, you know, we want to, we like reward. We want to achieve something, goal, we are goal-oriented. We, we want to, um, yes, we have a slight, we, we have a slightly higher goal. And because of that, we want to do slightly more. Then what should you do? Then I've already talked about taking a vow. But then, yes, by all means, try to, try to do things that will remind you Dharma, Buddha, and the Sangha. Especially the Dharma. And how do you do that? Well, Again, on the basic, fundamental level, you know, for the lazy people. Have a Buddha photo, paste it on your fridge. This will do. I'm serious. No need more. Just put a... Or a, have a... Have on your... What do you call it? Wallpaper. A Shakyamuni Buddha statue or a... Or the words of some, you know, some, some words of the teachings. Like that, it's really. And again, I'm not making this up. Why? Because why build temples? Why there is so, all, all these statues? It is just the same reason as having the wallpaper on the phone all to remind you, supposedly. You know, these kind of gadgets, this kind of reminder may not last long. Okay, 
okay, you like the Buddha. So now you, you buy a, I don't know, you download a photo of a Buddha and paste this on your, whatever, the wall. And maybe two or three days it will remind you the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. But then, after a few days, it will become just another um, paraphernalia in your house. It will not act, it will not remind you. So what do you do? You you change. You I don't know, you change the size of the photo. You put it another in another room. Whatever, whatever, whatever reminds you the Buddha, whatever reminds you the Dharma, you do that. And these things need to be accepted. I'm not talking about here a mere blind devotion or a ritual or some sort of a tradition or a culture. I'm talking about reminding the truth. Who? Reminding the truth and therefore the one who expounded the truth. This will do. Now, then what do you do? You are more ambitious now. This one to do it. This is so simple. I want to do more. Okay, let's add a little bit more. How about taking a vow? You already took the vow of, you know, refuge, uh, taking refuge. But this time more detail. So let's take a vow of not killing. But let's begin with not killing human beings. You know, lazy beings. Because you and I, I don't think you and I are diligent enough in go around killing human beings. That takes a lot of diligence. <laughs> that takes a lot of courage. It costs you money. It will cost you a life. You know, you, go, you don't go around <laughs> killing people. And even though you don't go around killing people, you also don't accumulate any merit. Do you know why? Because you're just being lazy. So let's turn this into something more, something like a path. So then as a follower of the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, from today I shall not kill human being. You understand? You add. I'm serious. You add. Yeah, maybe you will kill, kill a monkey or a bear or a cockroach or a, what is it? Um, mosquito. But, by the way, I'm not allowing you to kill any beings, okay? I'm not allowing you. I'm not. I'm talking about the lazy Buddhist, how you begin your path. As you keep on doing this, as you keep on habituating like this, then you will become this person who then send me messages. Rinpoche, I have a lot of cockroach in my house. <laughs> what do I do? I'm so frustrated. I have a small baby who's just, you know, two weeks old. And he might get sick, so on and so forth. I'm so happy when I receive these messages. I am far more happy than this person said, you know, I finished like 300 hours sitting. 300 hours sitting. All I could see is a flattened, fat smelled dafu <laughs> cushion. <laughs> you understand? That's all I see. Nothing. Okay, so you said probably your butt has become more flat. <laughs> That's about it. Not impressive. But someone who sent me a message saying, you know, I'm, I really don't like this, but what to do? I, I, I have to do something with this cockroach. Something is happening there. This person is not only, be, this person has not only become Buddhist, this person is about to become practitioner. Remember? Three categories I was telling. He's becoming practitioner. Not yet though. Not yet. Still <laughs> stuck with not killing human being only. <laughs> so, it's so a stuff like this. And not only, okay, so then, okay, then what do you do? You still want to do more? Okay, are you sure? You, maybe this is good enough. 
And there is even a word, there is even a uh, term for it. It's called najik jebigenyan. Najik jebigenyan, which means upasika that practices only one vow, single vow. I'm serious. It exists. It really exists in the sutras and the shastras. I'm not making this up. There's even a sutra where Buddha taught, taught to a butcher who said that, you know, I'm a butcher, I have to kill. You know, but I want, I'm so inspired by your teaching, I want to follow you. What do I do? Buddha said, you should take a vow not to kill after the sun set till sunrise. Of course, Buddha is not giving him permission to kill after the sunrise. You know, keep this in mind. It's a vow is something that you do, you take whatever you can. Okay, so, next, probably you want to upgrade yourself. You want to add one more vow. How about not stealing? Especially if you are sort of a klepto kleptomaniac, <laughs> right? Kleptomaniac who really, whose hand is itchy and, you know. <laughs> so, so what do you... What do you Okay, then you take a vow of not stealing things like people's earrings and nose rings or shoe, shoes, especially if it is a Doc Martin, whatever. You take like that. You understand? You so add on. Then you will reach to a stage where, again, I have friends who, have, who send me messages. Is it stealing to download a pirated movie? <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> ah, the Dharma is entering into this person's heart. I have friends who told me, you know, I, you know in London, so, oh, you know, I just took this double-decker and, you know, I totally forgot to give one pound or two pound and I feel so bad what to do. Because it's kind of, you know, taking you know, like taking uh, without being given. I feel very touched. Somebody is becoming a spiritual person. Somebody is becoming a practitioner. This is what we need to achieve. You understand? So you, you, you add, you add on. You understand? So, okay. So from, yeah, from that part, then you want to do a little bit more. I was told, okay, you want to do a little, you, okay, so you, you have done from not harming the other, others, you have taken a vow of not killing human beings, um, probably not stealing people's money, not yet, you know, not watching torrent, what is it? <laughs> Movies, not yet. But since now I have told you, I hope you will feel guilty when, when you do that. And if you do feel guilty, very good. It's, it's good. It means you are becoming a Dharma practitioner. Now, then, on top of that, you want to take a vow of helping others. But you are so lazy, like actually, you know, making a cup of tea for somebody is also such a big task for you. You understand? It's like helping others. And, uh, you know, it's just so... It's like... Um, And then also helping others is very complicated because when you help, you know, all these emotions of, you know, like um, getting acknowledged or not, these things creep in and uh, someone else not appreciating what you do also makes you feel disappointed. Mm -hmm. 
and most of the time uh, and sometimes what you do so called help in uh, uh, end up harming others that also is um, what do you call it um, uh, discouraging so then you take a lazy buddhist vow of helping others by um let's say there's so many I know what. I know one. It's really good. How about not meet people half an hour a week? You know, don't meet people half an hour because you are a trouble for people. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? <laughs> we are a, you know as a being we, we are a trouble for him other people. So you know help them by you know not appearing yourself so like every wednesday half an hour you stay in and if someone goes hey what's wrong with you you know don't worry you know i'm i'm trying to be helpful to the people you know and really genuinely do this genuinely from the heart i have to help beings by not going you know not being with the people if not maybe like taking a silent vow not talking it's such a help for other people my god <laughs> if you don't talk or then if you are you know if that's too much for you maybe things like i don't know like from the ecology point of view you know like not accepting plastic bags because you think that that is harming others by you just yourself not using plastic bags you probably will help the world the earth the future people like that so you add on what you call it the discipline of helping others this way you want to add more Okay. Now you take a vow or you discipline yourself in this is uh, to put it in a very sort of very very mundane language to acquaint yourself to the truth you need to do something so let's say actually reading 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 anything to do with a you know like mind Read, reading that will basically you know as we talked this morning with some lady here to pull rug out of your confirmation read uh, to dismantle your judgment um basically uh what do you call it um take you closer to the truth and when i say to the uh, closer to the truth i'm talking like all compounded things are impermanent so on and so forth the fourth truth so anything that takes you closer to the truth by this time you are about to elevate yourself 
from being Buddhas to a practitioner. You're becoming serious. I don't know whether we should go that far. Because then, then we have a lot of things to do. I think we should, um, you know, Okay, anyway, just, just for the idea, read, hear, and contemplate anything to do with the nature of phenomena, the illusory of phenomena, impermanence of the phenomena. So that's what we should do. Okay. Do you have some questions? I think this staying away from people for a for half an hour, a week. I have asked people to do it. And some some have done it and it created a lot of wonderful uh, you know it, it has a really positive effect. Probably you should try to do this. And it's also really good for yourself. This half an hour. And you can do whatever you like. You don't have to chant a mantra. You, don't, you, you just stay away from people. That's it. For, for them, not for you. And lots of merit. Can you imagine accumulating a lot of merit? by staying away from people. It's a really easy thing to do. It's so cheap also. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, can I ask a question about understanding that everything is, what we see is just our projection? Because the more I think about it, then I just freeze. Like doing, not doing, you know, everything is just illusion. And right. so? then what to do or what not to do or what not not to do. It's like just this vacuum that I get into and, you know, this merit, compassion, skillful means, all of that, it got sucks into this vacuum, which is not really a vacuum at the same time. It's like confused. Yeah. Actually, mm, yeah. Actually, because everything is an illusion, therefore, you should do this and that, and you should not do this and that. That's how you should think. If it is not illusion, then everything is fixed. Then you can't do much. Then everything is determined, everything is fixed. That because everything is illusion, illusion, illusory, therefore you can alter things. Not only everything is illusory, that everything is impermanent. So that's. So I don't understand. What do you mean? It's just that by the same token, I also can be not doing anything. Because everything is impermanent. Yes, I could do anything. Mm -hmm. Not anything, but, you know, according to karma, understanding that. But not doing also according to karma. Oh, There's no I difference see. in okay. that sense. Like, I'm just yeah. kind of frozen. Just either nor. Oh, I see. Okay. I think you are talking about a realization that everything is an illusion. Are you talking about that? Not just a mere intellectual understanding. Yes, if you have the if you have a complete realization that everything is illusion, then the distinctions of what to do and what not to do is collapse. Then of course you are not bound by that kind of category or that kind of distinctions. 
But for most of us, we only understand this on an intellectual level. It's like we understand the smoking is not good for health, but habitually we still want to smoke. And we are, what we are trying to get rid of is, what we are trying to combat is this wish to smoke, that yearning to smoke. Once that's collapsed, you can be rolling around in 5,000 packets of cigarettes. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You know, the cigarettes doesn't actually, it would be really nice and soft. Hmm. I'm okay. I need tanning. <laughs> Hello, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, can I trust that by acquiring good merit, I will naturally progress on the path? Because I believe it is only by good merit that I can, I have the fortune to listen to all your teachings. I believe it is good merit that makes me want very good. To understand the truth. Mm. So I'm wondering if the assumption that I should focus on attaining good merit yes. and simply trust that it will end up on the correct path. Very good. It's a little bit chicken and egg though. <laughs> because the Buddhist, the way Buddhists define merit is really based on how much of your act and your motivation is taking you closer to the truth. So, for instance, like giving alms to poor beggars, that generally speaking is considered a wholesome act. But if you do it with a motivation of, you know, like becoming the most philanthropic, you know, winner of the, some award for, you know, being the most generous person, so on and so forth, then that act is not really taking you closer to the, to the understanding of the impermanence, that, you know, the shunyata, you understand? So that act is not really considered virtuous action. In fact, it's a very vicious, seemingly virtuous, but actually it's very numbing and non-virtuous. You understand? So, um, this is why the third vow I was talking about, um, trying to the, the third discipline that uh, we can get used to, you know, I was talking about not harming, helping, and then getting acquainted with the truth, the discipline. That discipline is kind of a serious discipline. So if you take that discipline, you are about to become a Dharma practitioner. Um, so, okay, anyway, I keep on forgetting that... Um, we need to talk, uh, we need to, we need to talk things based on, you know, us being lazy and all of this. So let me think. <clears throat> How do we accumulate merit as a lazy person? This is a lazy bunch, by the way. You understand? We are lazy, really, really lazy. I am. I'm very, very lazy. And distracted. Not only lazy distracted, all of this. Actually, we have talked this morning. If you admire, really, if you admire the truth of impermanence, that's so much merit. So much merit. More than offering a lot of lamps and arms to the beggars. Buddha said it. This is what Buddha said. Of all the footprints, the elephant's footprint is the most, is the mightiest. Likewise, of all the thoughts, the mightiest and the most wholesome thought is the thought of thinking impermanence. So that has a lot of merit. And then also, Sometimes admiring to the concept, not even meditating. Huh? Don't get me wrong. You, you know, remember we are lazy? We don't meditate. <laughs> remember? We only like, wow, everything is impermanent. That's so nice. That's true. That's it. 
Don't go beyond that. Otherwise, you then you will you are no more lazy. You understand? Remember, we are lazy. So, ah, impermanence, good. That's good enough. A lot of merit. And then sometimes, oh, what you see, how it appears, is not what it is. Ah, this makes sense. Yeah, I, I can see that. Things are not how it appears. Your appearance is deceiving. You understand? Yeah. It's all my projection. Yeah, that, that's kind of nice. I admire this. I really like this. That's good enough. So, once a month, one minute, you do. You admire that. So much merit. I can, uh, I'll, if you don't believe, I'll sign this. And I'll <laughs> thumbprint. This much is all you need. What this will do? This admiration, this liking towards this kind of concept will then become a habit, just like smoking. You never, you know, you didn't come out from mother's womb with a cigarette and a lighter. <laughs> you develop this liking towards the cigarette through, you know, introduction and, you know, like conviction and the style and all of this, like that. You, you develop this liking, admiration towards the Dharma. That's what you, lazy people. I do this, really. This is all, actually, yeah. 99%. That's all I do. I admire the Dharma. I can proudly say this one. Yeah. If anyone here asks me, okay, so it looks like you are a Buddhist, what do you do? I admire these things. And therefore, I am qualified to claim myself a Buddhist, because I admire this. And I, I try to admire this, you know, I would say maybe, yeah, weekly basis. <laughs> weekly. <laughs> weekly. It is difficult. You try once a month. You try. You try. 25th, remember? <laughs> next, next, next month, 25th. <clears throat> Put it on your, what is it? Reminder. With the alam. That's all you need. And I'm telling you, this is more important than sitting. Just sitting. Not admiring the Dharma. You understand? If you do the admiring the Dharma and the sitting, oh yes, of course. Then you, then you are <laughs> rocket flying. You understand? <laughs> of course, that's different. But if you are doing none of these admiration to the Dharma. This is what nowadays is, this is what the medita meditations, meditators are doing. They don't talk about the Dharma. They only talk about the sitting. That part, not so rewarding, I don't think so. Okay, I'm yeah. waiting a little bit, uh, as the sun goes, goes a little bit down, then we'll meditate a little bit. Hello? You try to be not so lazy, just a little bit. Uh, I come from China, but okay. uh, I, I can speak a little English, so uh, someone can help me translate, translate okay. it. Uh, okay. I want to ask a question. There is a teacher who said that two thousand years ago, uh, 2000年前, 出现了佛陀Rinpoche, the question is, uh, Osho once said that 2,500 years ago, uh, Buddha came to this world. 1,500 years ago or 1,800 years ago, Jesus Christ came. Um, 
and all we could do is to imitate. But just by imitating, it's hard to transcend and go beyond them. So what should we do? That's the question. Are you a lazy person? <laughs> you are not lazy? You are not lazy? Oh, well, then I can't teach you anything. <laughs> this is only for lazy people. What? No, no, either you are lazy or not. You know, you can't, you can't have both. Those who are diligent, please don't come back from tomorrow. <laughs> if you are lazy, okay, I'll just give you the answer. <laughs> if you are lazy, I've already said, just admire the Buddha, admire the Dharma, Buddha and the Sangha. That's it. That will do. I'm serious. This is so important. I think this is, this is absolutely important. I've been thinking about this for a long time. Much more important than Madhya, Mika, Prajana, Paramita, you know, Pramana, all that. This is important. To admire. <laughs> Yes. In the morning, uh, you mentioned... You are lazy? Yes. <laughs> are you sure? Yes. I don't believe you. <laughs> okay, tell me. In the morning, you mentioned about the four seas and how, unless you have complete conviction in them, you really call, cannot call yourself a Buddhist. Um, my question is that doubt is something which Buddha himself has encouraged. Right. So how do the Buddhists really uh, distinguish between having a doubt and having the wrong view? From Buddhists distinguish having a right view? Did you say? Um, distinguish between, let's say, you have a doubt right. about the teachings. Right. And maybe you, you wonder if some things are permanent. Right. Between that kind of a doubt and having the wrong view. Oh. It's a good, important question, but it's not a lazy person's question. <laughs> anyway, I will try to answer this. The doubt and conviction, now we are talking about, okay, because of this question, we, we have to talk about the third category a little bit, practitioners. Okay, or the, on the verge of becoming a practitioner. If you are a practitioner, then you need to know that the doubt and convictions will go off from now till enlightenment. And there, the difference between these two are very, very thin. Um, probably the word doubt is a bit of a, what do you call it, misinterpretation of um, uh, the Tibetan word is the sosoto vishera. sort of, I think, discriminating sort of intellect. That's an important. So, discrimination, discriminating kind of intelligence, that, that's a very, very important. I've recently said in Europe that people cherish skepticism and analytical mind. And, you know, there are people who think that the Vajrayana is a cult and a you know, all this thing. And I was saying, well, do you want to be a skeptical? Do you want to be analytical? Do you really want to be critical? You should practice. You should come and study Vajrayana. Because there and only there you will learn the final s s art of skepticism. Because right now, the, you know, this scientists and intellectual and journalist skeptic mind is so small. It's not even 
from the Mahayana point of view, is not even in the level of, it will not be even considered skepticism. It's already a one, it's already a lopsided decision. It's already a decision. Yes, so this conviction and, okay, let's call it a doubt, discriminating in intellect, is a ingredient of path. And remember, the path I've said, path are designed to erode itself. That's an important message, by the way. That's an important, but if you want to hear this more, you have to become a practitioner. Then, then little bit, you know, you can't afford to be lazy. You have to be doing a little bit more. Okay. Now, now that you've emphasized so much about admiring the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, all into the danger of this intellectually. Like a physicist might say, oh, so beautiful Einstein's theory of relativity, so elegant, almost poetry. And there's a lot of admiration there, but it's all coming from the head. How do we, from where does the admiration for the, from where should it come? From the heart, I would imagine. And how do we then not fall into the danger that, oh, Madhyamika philosophy is so wonderful, so complete, so superior to the Western one. So I admire that. And therefore, I admire the person who propounded it. But we, we are talking, I think, of admiration in a different sense. So how do we distinguish this? See, you are talking from the point of view of non-lazy people. <laughs> yes. Because from a lazy person like me, even that is already good enough. You know, it's like this. It's like this. Why do we build big stupas and statues? Why do we hoist flags? Supposedly, it gives you an impression. Impression. Like sight of the Buddha, sight of a Dharma, will come, sort of somehow imprint something unconsciously. And it will stay in your system until it gets, uh, it, it gets broken or destroyed. Otherwise, it stays. So on the most, most fundamental level, a skeptic, analytical, someone who really detests religion, detests Buddhism, but admires all these concepts, to me, I'm happy. Because what will happen is it, it, it will become a, imprint in their head. Yeah? Wait, wait, not finished. <laughs> this is not finished because remember what did Chan, uh, Chandakirti Chingu Umajubana Yoro Tony Samatayagri Michu Shoryata Chingu Luji Babuda It's always good to have this campus right next to you. <laughs> Because they read by heart. You know, when asked Chandakirti, to whom should we teach emptiness? He didn't say to the Harvard graduates or, you know, like Oxford graduates. He didn't say that. He said to those people who, by m merely mentioning the word emptiness, there's a goosebump in their body. There's a tears in their eyes. They are the ones who are qualified to hear the shunyata. So, you know, how does that happen? Through imprint, habitual, habituation. So on that level, you know, and also here, I need to tell you this. I think here, some people may refu uh, you know, argue with me by saying that I'm losing quality you know, I, I'm, am I not interested in quality Buddhist, right? Quality, you know, really quality Buddhist. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, I'm interested in quality, but I'm more interested in quantity, <laughs> much, much more. Because where do you find cream if you have no milk? So I want, I want lots and lots and lots of admirers for the Buddha's teaching. Even it is an intellectual 
one is good for now and probably 500 lifetimes later they may wake up <laughs> but meanwhile there will be people like you i don't know these guys they will make sure that this person will not settle with just an intellectual admiration they will do prayers we will do prayers so that they will upgrade their intellectual admiration from the ad admiration from the heart and that and with all these cause and conditions the real admiration i mean the complete admiration will come actually this is important Compl the, i'm using the word complete admiration <coughs> there's even a there's a word in the mahayana we call it michevichola <laughs> zaba there's, there's a term called and it's a really important term means that, that, that fact or the truth of non-arising means patience Only when you reach the first bumi, that's quite a high level. Only when you reach the first bumi, you have the complete admiration to the Dharma. Right now, it's a, always a partial. The reason is some of the information of the Dharma you cannot tolerate, such as shunyata. Even the four seal, if you look at the four seal, or most of you probably intellectually, intellectually you can tolerate the truth that all compounded things are impermanent. Wouldn't you say that? You can sort of tolerate this? Now, as the gentleman who spoke this morning, already all all emotions are pain? Wow, let's see. You understand? That that's already intolerant. You know, that's, you cannot tolerate that, that information. All emotions are pain? Come on. How about a romance? How about love? How about a devotion? You understand? So that's already too much. And then the next, all phenomena has no inherently existing nature. Now that, you think you tolerate this? I admire that. I admire the fact that you think you are tolerating this. <laughs> I really do. It's it's so sweet. It's, it's really sweet. <laughs> it's because if you really hear this, it will really break your heart. And then the last one, Nirvana is beyond extreme. Oh my God. You know, what is, what is nirvana? Nirvana is our goal, isn't it? That's what we are looking for. That's what we are aiming for. And finally someone says, it's beyond extreme. It's not, a, you know, in fact, what, this is what Shantideva said. Remember, I, you know, some of you have been hearing this from me many times. Shantideva said, you are allowed to keep one, one ignorance for the time being. And what is that ignorance? thinking that there is an enlightenment. So what does that mean? There's no enlightenment? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> so what is it? No enlightenment? Or there is enlightenment? No enlightenment? No. You cannot, you cannot verbalize. You cannot conceptualize that. Do you really tolerate this? Why are you sitting in this bench, you know, like in this hot sun. Because you're looking for a goal, and suddenly someone says this goal is inexpressible. It's not tolerable. It's not tolerable. You, know, you, you cannot tolerate this. So, complete admiration to the Dharma happens 
complete tolerance to the Dharma happens only when you reach to the first Bhumi. Okay? And the first Bhumi, we are not talking about a lazy person. We are talking about a really, really, really diligent person. And let's go back to the lazy, lazy level. Okay, I think uh, we can do some... Um, sitting. Okay, this time it's a lazy, lazy sitting. I'm not telling you anything. Just sit. Let us sit three minutes. The world will be saved from you for three minutes. <laughs> That's it. Those who want to be slightly more diligent, you can do this maybe like once a year. <laughs> it's called, you know, there's a, the term is Luen. Luen means isolating your body. I'm not giving you any visualization, nothing, nothing complicated. All you need to do is sit somewhere, isolate. Retreat your body, this troublemaker called body, from bedroom to bathroom, bathroom to living room, it doesn't matter, wherever, for three minutes. Do not bow down to its you know, needs and wants, just for three minutes. Okay, maybe what we should do is tomorrow we should do maybe t 4 30. What do you think? In the afternoon? Yeah, 4 30. Is it too hot for you? Now is good? Now is good. Okay, so tomorrow we start around 4 30. Morning? Maybe. No, no, we are lazy. <laughs> Let's stick with the morning same time, 8.30, okay? But um, soon we are going to meet again, right? Oh, we are meeting 7 o'clock? Okay. So those who want to come, 7 o'clock, is it? We can be ready, but you can come and start. Okay. 6.30 you should come here, I think. <laughs> That's it. Please.
Can I ask one more question? Okay. If you want to ask one more, why not? I'm a, I'm a lazy person. Okay, very good. <laughs> I'm a lazy person, but not everybody like me. So there's a lot of problems happen because not, they are not lazy enough. Because of, they are not lazy enough, there's fight, right? And then? If our ancestor is lazy, there's not going to be so much flight, fight. No, not so much problems, conflicts, or uh, not so much countries even, right? <laughs> because we're lazy. We don't want to establish our own country. So because there's, what's happening today is that so many countries established and there are wars okay. and there are wars and the like, different religions uh, different uh, you know trust different beliefs cause a lot of problems I see. so, so uh, we are ambitious like we, you said people are not like you emphasize lazy enough uh, we want to do more and nowadays the technology develop very fast like AI a lot of things I think this universe is going to destroyed by this sort of things like the founder of uh, Taoism said, you know, <laughs> the technology de develops, the, a lot of problems gonna happen next. So uh, I think a lot of things, problems happen, occurred because of people are not lazy enough. So I read really my, like your philosophy of laziness. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think, I think we are, we're gonna we are, destroy no, it by wait, ourselves. We are talking about two different kinds of laziness here. <laughs> I think you are talking about this Chinese Taoist wisdom called Wu Wei, Wu Wei, yes. Wu Wei, the art of doing that all. Oh, that one comes into the third category. Remember I was talking admirer of Buddhism, Buddhist, and the practitioner. And even the practitioner, we divide into many, many levels, and the one of the highest probably can really understand what you are talking about, the Wu Wei, the laziness. That's, that's not really laziness, that's, that's a, wow, that's a difficult one. You try to do one minute, I will not be able to do that. That's a, that's a highest diligence. Okay, we meet around 6.30.